Javago Lang resigns from the Senate. More doubts about the renationalization of BTC. If the Prime Minister does with that which is financially prudent, uh, nothing will become of it. A fetus discard in a hospital parking lot. Stricter regulations for the Surrey industry. I'm Nikia DeVoe and this is NB12 Weekend. Good evening everyone, thanks for joining us this Saturday for NB12's Weekend Edition. Topping news this evening, Free National Movement Senator Javargo Lang has announced that he will resign from the Senate at the end of the year. Today, Lang sent a release stating that he advised opposition leader Dr. Hubert Minnis of his plans yesterday after careful thought. Lang will be tendering his resignation from the Senate and as Shadow Minister of Finance with effect from the 30th of 31st of December. That's about six weeks from now. Lang says he gave the FNM leader advance notice to give him enough time to select a replacement. Lang's letter stressed that his decision to resign is personal and in no way reflects upon the leader or the FNM. He said that moving forward, his life will involve much travel and activities that will make it challenging for him to give the level of service to the Senate that would be required. Lang thanked Dr. Minnis for giving him the opportunity to serve as senator and says he will be available to assist him and the party wherever possible. He also thanked Bahamians for their support. Lang said he will deliver his letter of resignation to the Senate president in the near future. Well, as negotiations between the government and cable and wireless communications continue, one political pundit says he doubts the government will seriously try to take back control of the telecom provider. Former acting FNM chairman Darren Cash says the Prime Minister won't follow through BTC's renationalization. Paige McCartney reports. The negotiations have been described as fruitful by cable and wireless CEO Tony Rice, who stated in the firm's interim results that although the new government has indicated its preference regarding BTC, it has also made it clear that it respects the current agreement. But Cash says he believes the Prime Minister and his renegotiation committee are just simply going through the motions of conducting talks with cable and wireless to appease the Bahamian people and fulfill the promise made on the election campaign trail. Cash said any sound thinking leader would realize that taking back control of an entity so soon after its sale, regardless of the initial objection to the sale by the populace, would not be in the best interest of the country. If the Prime Minister does with that which is financially prudent, uh, nothing will become of it. If he is reckless, then we, we don't know what might actually happen. We hope that he will be prudent, we hope that he will be well reasoned and calm um, and that nothing that is a, ultimately a waste of, of money um, will, will be done. The high-level negotiations between the government and CWC executives began in September. Cash said he believes the PLP made unrealistic promises to the Bahamian people. And I think the Prime Minister is intent on attempting something whether or not he is, he is appreciative of the fact that few people really believe he has any credible option to reverse the deal that does not come with enormous costs um, to the Bahamian public because I'm sure cable and wireless may be prepared uh, to change the deal but at the right financial price. We happen to think that would be cost prohibitive and not necessarily in the immediate or long-term best interest of the Bahamas. So, Yes, Prime Minister Christie is intent on talking. They'll probably go through the motions of some talking. Um, it's not realistic in our view because the costs are going to be prohibitive. According to multiple London analysts, the most likely scenario will be a buyback of 2% control, giving the government its 51% stake. However, CWC would retain executive control of the company through its corporate structure. Analysts called the move a face-saving procedure for the Bahamian government. Cash said the mounting political risk associated with the renegotiation of this or any other deal with foreign investors carries huge implications. 
hopefully um, calmer and wiser heads will prevail because it's not in the country's long-term um, economic interest. You can listen to the um, executives of the Bahamas Chamber of Commerce who said on multiple occasions that they think this sends the wrong message to the international community. Well, that has significant um, implications not only in the Bahamian um, immediate community, but as far as our ability to attract foreign direct investments. Foreign investors are not interested in knowing that when they come here and enter into a long-term deal expected to last 10, 15, or 20 years, that in three years when a new government comes in, um, all bets could be off the table. Following the launch of an investigation into BTC services by the Utilities Regulation and Competition Authority, the company's CEO Jeff Houston says BTC is taking a proactive approach to problems facing its network. The company chief told our news team during an interview this week that future meltdowns in the network are less likely because of new features that have been implemented to back up the multi-million dollar network. We're not actually waiting for, for IRCA's uh, feedback. We're continuing on to improve the resilience uh, and the, the whole quality of that infrastructure at that particular site. The last week we had a, a new generator arrived, that was another three quarters of a million dollar investment. And so we're, we're, and we're as, as part of our the rollout of our networks, we're making sure that we, we improve the design of the network so that if one site fails, it can fail over to another. And so the whole, we're, we're trying to embed that philosophy into BTC in terms of taking a, a, a quality of service approach to everything that we do. Back in June, the Bahamas experienced a nationwide blackout on the very day the CEO of parent company Cable and Wireless Communications, Tony Rice, visited the country to meet with the Prime Minister. BTC attributed the meltdown to a commercial power failure at the Point Siena Drive facility, which houses the majority of the company's telecommunications facilities. The plant's generator and batteries failed to kick in and keep the system running, according to the company. Houston said while there is no guarantee that there won't be another system failure ever, customers can rest assured that BTC is taking the necessary measures to, present it from, to prevent it from easily happening. I think you, you can never eliminate the possibility. No company can ever eliminate that kind of possibility, but we are reducing the risk. Erker's final determination on the incident is expected soon, but Houston said the company is not waiting on that determination before addressing system problems. By the way, there are disruptions expected when BTC does another upgrade tonight. Service should normalize by the morning. In other news, the sudden death of a Surrey horse in the middle of the street earlier this week has brought international attention to the industry, but not in a good way. Many foreigners have threatened to stay away from the Bahamas until the Surrey industry is shut down. But the government says war will be done to improve it. Tonight, we take a look at fallout from the incident, industry regulations, and what proposed changes are on the table. Dr. Quezzy Smith was the first vet on the scene when the 22-year-old horse Bloody Mary collapsed and died on Dowdsville Street while pulling a surrey Tuesday afternoon. He says eyewitnesses told him that a driver was racing the horse against two others earlier that day and he believes that led to the horse's heart attack. The acute renal kidney failure, the acute liver failure, the acute, the acute dehydration would not happen in a horse that is just pulling the surreys periodically throughout the day. After Bloody Mary's story and pictures went viral, an international online petition titled Stop the Abuse of Carriage Horses in the Bahamas was created. Petition sponsor Paula Karuna asked for people to sign to stop brutality against horses who are, quote, made to work in horrendous heat through the polluted crazy streets of Nassau with no food or water and no conditions for up to eight hours a day. There were 1,181 signatures up to airtime from people all over the world, including France, Serbia, Argentina, Germany, and Russia, just to name a few countries. Robin Jenkins from Florida wrote, quote, There are no words to describe what takes place in the Bahamas when it comes to animals. I will never visit there, ever. End quote. But Dr. Smith says that people's perception of the industry are usually incorrect or grossly exaggerated. 
He says in his professional opinion, many horse owners are passionate about their horses but struggle to care for them. And he said that based on inspections, very few owners mistreat their horses, but it does happen. According to Smith, the inspections carried out once a month on Fort Charlotte are very thorough and horses are failed or limited in their activity if they do not pass all the tests. That means now that I have to give the, uh, the owner recommendations of what to do now. This horse needs some rest. Bring it back in a month. Or I would say get some antibiotics or whatever the case may be um, and um, treat the horse. We'll check the horse in two weeks. But typically, once you fail inspection this month, you're off of work until you pass inspection the next month. And if you fail again, you're just supposed to be not working. But he says the challenge is enforcing those rules as there is currently nobody monitoring the horses and the drivers on a daily basis. According to Smith, the board is exploring options in that area. Bloody Mary was only cleared for one day of work a week and was not fit for strenuous activity. We do not have right now the ability and the manpower to enforce all those regulations. But out of the meeting yesterday, we're going to up the efforts. All right? Um, I've taken it upon myself to drive out there some, some days to see what is going on. You have to f figure out now who we're going to employ, basically, to be the day-to-day -day invigilators of the Surrey horse industry. And we have, to have a, we have to get through to the owners that we need to do this for the betterment of the product. Since the incident, the CAB's Hackney Board has met with transport officials to discuss the way forward. The board is responsible for regulating the Surrey industry and is comprised of officials from the Ministry of Tourism, the Ministry of Transport, Agriculture, the Bahamas Humane Society and two veterinarians. One of those vets is Dr. Smith. He told us that the board is looking at ways to enforce the guidelines that are already in place and making some changes. He says they discussed updating the legislation, which has been around since 19. 1909, including the price Surrey operators can charge per person. It has been $10 for decades. Smith says if they can charge more, it would help owners take better care of the horses. Let's take a thousand pound horse, right? Um, you're talking about uh, 100 pounds of food a day, maybe, if you go by the 10% body weight feed. And that's going to run you anywhere between $50 and $70 a day. You're talking three, dollars $400 a week, $1,000 a month, $12,000 a year. And then you haven't added anything about shoeing or veterinary care or deworming protocols. So maybe 20000 a horse a year. While many people are calling for the industry to be shut down, Dr. Smith says the act of pulling surreys itself is not harmful to horses who, when in good health, can pull 100 times their weight. He says it is possible to keep the industry afloat while ensuring that the animals are treated humanely if all parties work together. They're also looking at the possibility of communal housing for the horses.